Yeah. So uh, I just want to introduce Mohamed Yudin. He's a postdoc over at SickKids. He did his undergrad and his PhD at Memorial University in human genetics, and then he was lucky, or we were lucky, to get him at the Center for Applied Genomics at SickKids to work in Steve Scherer's lab, and he's going to talk about an integrated genomic approach to identify genes associated with de developmental delay. And thanks a lot for doing this for us, Mohamed. Thank awesome. you, Dennis. Uh, so I have 10 minutes, I'll be uh, talking very, with, with a very speed pace up because they will cut me off after 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so just an introduction of the developmental delay. It's a collection of rare conditions and that primarily includes uh, intellectual disabilities, autism, spectrum disorder, uh, mental retardation, and learning disabilities. Uh, and the population prevalence of uh, developmental delay uh, is about 3%. Uh, and the primary diagnostic for developmental delay patients are the chromosomal microarray, and uh, it has a very good turnout rate right? because in uh, developmental delay we tend to get large deletion amplifications uh, for about 10 to 15 percent of the cases. So even if you do natural sequencing, those large values still there. Uh, so the clinical microarray is very low resolution uh, because we are targeting to detect large CMBs. So it's 180K, but the probes are really good. They have validated probes. And we, we end up getting about 10 CMBs per sample. And usually, we, because it's clinical, uh, it's performed in a clinical setting, so we don't usually have uh, map, platform match controls. So it's just case data. And what uh, the clinician does is they each of, for each of the patients, they look at the 10 CNBs and ascertain them whether the CNBs are whether clinically significant or some variant of uncertain significance because there is lack of evidence what the gene does for those variants. Or if the variants are common in population, that's a benign uh, CNB. So the pro problem with the clinically significant and BOUS uh, variants are, are we don't know. Um, what are the genes that are associated with the death delay? Even though we know the prevalence of this clinically significant variants are high in cases compared to controls, but these variants tend to have like 30, 40 genes, and we don't know what are the genes that can be really associated with the condition. Uh, so this is the data we have. It's coming from two different hospitals, so Sick Case Hospital and Credit Valley. Uh, so the total discovery data set includes 10,000 samples, 10,600. And we also have integrated other samples from other databases. So at the end, we have about uh, 29,000 cases uh, to analyze. And as I said, we don't have match controls, but we have high resolution microarray controls. And we have about 10,000 of these new controls for this study. And we also have um, uh, downloaded and using these other 10,000, 11,000 controls from other databases. So we have about 20,000 controls. So initially, anybody will think, oh, you have a case control data. Why don't you do a case control association study? Well, you can do it, of course. But the problem is the control variants are small for the clinically significant variants. Even if you do gene level association, you end up getting so many genes to be with high p values. So at the end, we still do not know what are the genes because you have one of the study in Nature Genetics uh, came out showing 3,800 genes have a p-value at least 0 0.0.01. Uh, so really, we don't know how to approach this uh, to find out or tease out the, at least the candidate genes. So this is the uh, problem that uh, I'll be discussing for this talk. So this is the uh, diagram of the whole data. So about 5% of the patient are di diagnosed with a clinically significant loss. Uh, BOUS variance is about 18% for loss. And gain is about 1.8% gain or duplication are clinically significant, uh, whereas 31% gain are BOUS. Because for gain, it's hard to determine the pathogenicity because we don't know where the other configured part of the of the region in the genome. Uh, so we did a screen of the uh, uh, known syndrome eclocyte to see what are the syndromes in our 10,000 cases uh, the enriched, the, the, just the known ones. It looks like uh, there's 1%, uh, it, there's one 
uh, region that reads 1%, it is uh, 22 Q, uh, 1 1. Deletion and duplication. Then there is a well known region like 16 P 11.2, uh, that is about 0 0.8%. So it is a mix of uh, different syndromes, this whole cohort. Uh, so this is the pipeline we'll, what uh, we are doing and we will do in the next couple of days. So after getting the clinical annotation, we are doing a, you know, a three different analyses. One is concretical exon analysis. The second part is the protein expression network analysis for those genes. And the, for the non coding part, we are doing a concern in uh, Initially, we did, just wanted to see if the clinically significant variants have any male or female bias. So we found that female are ascertained for more clinically significant variants compared to male because female requires more pathogenic uh, variant to manifest their phenotype compared to the male. Uh, but that's a totally different discussion. Uh, so this is what we found. We, we, we see this in the combined data, which is the top diagram. Also, we see the trend in, uh, in individual analysis in the two hospitals. So in terms of uh, number of genes in the variants of clinically significant and BUS, uh, you can see the numbers of genes are in thousands. So it's really uh, tough to know what are the genes. So the critical exon analysis that we initially use uh, is, uh, the definition of critical exon is uh, if an exon has a low mutation burden in the population, but it has a high expression in the brain. So that exon is uh, conserved for functional relevance into that tissue. So this is what we call critical exon. Uh, and this exon shown to be a highly uh, targeted for de novo mutation in autism spectrum disorder. So we already published this paper in Nature Genetics showing the investment of uh, de novo mutation in critical exon. So what, what we wanted to see if the critical exons are enriched in clinically significant variants for certain genes uh, compared to the control genes. So this is the results look like the red dots are showing the critical exon ratio for the clinically significant variance genes, and the blue dots are showing uh, critical exon ratio for, for the control genes. So the top panel is for loss CS and loss BUS. The bottom panel is for, uh, actually, the, uh, is a, anyways, the bottom panel, panel is for gains. Uh, so you can see that there are uh, uh, statistically significant clinical, uh, clinical exon enrichment in gene sets with uh, um, clinically significant variants. So next, having that uh, as a tool, what we did next, we took the proteome expression data that came up in nature, the human proteome map. Uh, this is um, Fourier transformation uh, data uh, from adult to prenatal, pre prenatal to adult tissues. And we use 30 histological tissue from this database to construct a prote proteomic uh, map. So we applied WGCNA to cluster the genes, and we uh, obtained about 23 cluster of genes. <coughs> and one, then for each cluster, we went through the gene ontology database to see what each cluster means. Then we found one cluster, or module, we can say, is really uh, enriched with uh, synaptogenesis and brain development. And then we wanted to see if that module is also enriched with critical exon or not. Then so it turns out the left, the panel, uh, D panel, showed the critical exon enrichment of that module with the uh, empirical p value. Then this four um, permutation uh, distribution shows the uh, enrichment of clinically significant and VUS genes in that module. So. Then what we did, we combined the critical exon and the proteomic map analysis to come up with candidate genes. So this is uh, the criteria, primary criteria that we use. So the gene have to be highly enriched en highly with critical exon in human developmental brain. And it must be part of the blue module that I showed in the earlier slide. And the gene also have to be impacted by one CSR VUS variant. So then these genes are uh, our candidate genes to follow up with more genetic data. 
So this is one of the variant uh, we are following up. So it has multiple de novo variants that are detected in MSH6 and FX, FBXO11 gene. Uh, if you look at the gene, the mismatch repair gene already been associated with cancer, but it is a low penetrant gene. But the ABXO11 uh, gene is, uh, we followed up this gene and we found additional three de novo deletion uh, in other databases. And also the exome sequencing showed one de novo SNVs in an autism program. So we think the ABXO11 gene is, uh, is a very good candidate gene. Then we looked at the protein network and we saw the first degree neighbors and we saw the red networks, the red uh, genes are the genes with, that have a de uh, mutation in, from exome studies uh, found in autism program, uh, which that is highly connected with the MPXO11 gene. So this gene is the protein module, uh, the protein expression is similar, behaving similarly with the other uh, ca candidate gene for autism. So, um, and this gene already been implicated with Otis Media. Otis Media is a um, family-based association analysis for it's a type of hearing loss, and also knockout monologues so in mouse in show to, uh, to result, it result in deaf mutant. So it can be a very good candidate for development uh, today. Uh, Another gene is the PP1, PPP1R9A gene, that is a, a, a maternal imprinted gene. And this gene, we have, a, we have the shortest deletion uh, in this gene in our cohort that, uh, that is de novo, not found in parents, but in the proband. And the, following this gene, we also found uh, two additional de novo deletions, and one uh, de novo SNB is uh, in, uh, reported to be uh, in an autism program. So this gene also um, maternally imprinted and it is biologically expressed in the tissue, but for the CNS tissue, it is uh, maternally expressed. And the protein encoded uh, by this gene is involved in neuroid formation. Uh, so I'll, I'll end up the talk by acknowledging my supervisor, Stephen Shearer. Uh, James Serapolis and Marsha Piva, who also involved uh, providing the data, and all of the uh, statistician and bioinformatics people who helped us on the analysis, uh, and uh, <coughs> different uh, databases uh, that where people helped us on following the mutation. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? I have a quick one for Brainspan. I believe there's there's RNA there's um there's sequencing data and there's also axon array. Does yes. the critical axon stuff? I always wondered. Does that work for the axon array measurements as well? Yes, we did the critical axon. <coughs> well, we did uh, the critical axon measurement using RNA seq and microarray data. So in our Nature Genetics paper, we okay. used both data and they both kind of show, shows robust results for critical axon. There there are some axon in the gene that are really showing high expression in both platforms and do not have any mutation accumulation in general populations. So it's really interesting to, to see some of these actions are really uh, preserved for brain function uh, and brain regulation. Yeah. I have a question. I guess. Yes. Is the protein data quantitative or qualitative? It's quantitative. Okay. So it's we, I'm thinking of a different picture. No, it's like for each gene is the average spectra count. Okay. Data. Thanks. So I wonder if this copy number uh, aberrations and alterations, are they uh, de novo or are they uh, related to the other gene? Yeah, the aberrations are de novo. Okay, so I haven't showed the whole data. So we have about uh, 160 de novo mutation in the whole cohort. But, uh, Usually when they in the clinic, when the, the patient comes in, they really do not check for inheritance all the time, mm -hmm. because most of the time the parent gene is not available. Yeah. But you can look at the variant, if it is 16P11.2, you already know it's a pathogenic variant, because you don't see it in normal population at all. So you, even though the pathogenic variants are there, we don't know the exact estimation for de novo. 
just because the nature of the clinical data is like that. But if it is a research data, that would have known their data. 